much for getting us up so that we need additional equipment. We can request that by radio. Uh, some protocols call for the additional equipment. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, we're going to be back in a little bit and look at some other equipment that we have here at the uh, firehouse where we're at Nemo Del Sol Fire Station. The second fire station, uh, 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 I guess it's, uh, what is the yeah, SM? Stardust. Stardust. This is evidenced by the chief's <laughs> I see. Do you get to sample all of this? I have my fair share, yes. Huh? Well, I see more are safe where everyone wants to follow them. Looks like they're picking up some pretty good things over there. We have some guys who are very good cooks. Uh, they like to, uh, to fix various things that are somewhat exotic, uh -huh. uh, sometimes basics. Uh, at the same time, they're very careful about what they eat. Yeah. A lot of salads, chicken, um, Occasionally they'll splurge and have a huge breakfast on Sunday yeah. morning so that it throws all the calories and uh, those things have to do But they also do a very intensive uh, training as far as uh, running and uh, that type of thing. I've seen them around all to the area on that. That's correct. We have an average of an hour and a half a day of probably the work day set aside for physical agility training. Uh, it involves uh, warm-ups, workouts, uh, run. We have a weight training room at the Camino Del Sol station where they come in and they work out and do weightlifting and so on. Firefighting is, by its nature, a very stressful job. Even if there's no fires, yeah. it's, uh, the tone goes off, you don't know what they're headed for, and the tension's there, the stress is there. Physical uh, fitness is, is a major element. So we just have to go out and get out and uh, get ready uh, just to have our bodies ready for that activity. Chief, we're going to take a little break right now on the round and about, and we're going to be back and be talking about some of the other equipment that you have here, so don't bother to go away because we've got some great things coming up here as we're going to be talking to Chief Rowlandson here at the fire department office or the uh, station, I guess. What do you call What is the, the vernacular for that? This is our headquarters station. Headquarters. Okay, real good. We'll be in a little bit here. And welcome once again back to Around and About. I'm Lynn Reed and we're talking to Fire Chief John Rowlandson, Chief of the Sun City West Fire Department. And uh, we've had some good information on the 9-11, on the new ambulances that we have in our area, some of the response time. And now it's time to talk about uh, the fire uh, equipment itself. And I think we have one right here. Uh, this is kind of the state of the art, isn't it, John? That's correct, Lynn. Uh, even as, as old as the unit is, it's just now 10 years old, uh, there's, the state of the art is changing very rapidly. This is one of our original fire trucks uh, when the district was formed. It's a, a Mack fire truck. It has a 1,000 GPM pump, diesel driven. And we have two trucks just like this one. Uh, we also have a uh, brand new E1, Emergency One Hush. It's a completely computerized vehicle. Um, like all new things, it requires a lot more maintenance. That's where it happens to be today. It's just getting some maintenance. Yeah. That particular truck is a fully enclosed air-conditioned cab. Uh, it's a rear engine, so the cab is completely flat. Uh, it's totally computerized. And for an old lineman like me, I'm looking for knobs <laughs> and handles to pull, and there's, you know, they're sitting there with a push button, so it's kind of different. Um, we also have a 55-foot ladder truck. Which operates out of the uh, Starlight Station. It also has a fire pump, and fire hose, and all the things that an engine company would have. Mm -hmm. Now, when this change came from uh, rural metro to uh, the district that we have now, uh, Sun City West Fire District, I guess is what mm -hmm. it would be. Uh, there, you had to buy new things. Uh, what what all equipment came with it, and how did you work that out? When uh, when we decided to. Uh, to not renew the contract, one of these we look at was what kind of equipment that we have that was on. The fire district owned the trucks, the tires, and the truck. All the fire equipment, the holders, the nozzles, the safety equipment, the medical equipment, was all in the real metro. And we used over the past year, some men who were running and were working in committees to determine what equipment we had to have, what equipment we'd like to have, prices, bid quotes, and the whole works. And then what about the process of buying all of that equipment uh, with the board's approval? And we started taking it in last spring, marking it, getting it in the inventory, testing it, training with it, so it's new, uh, and beyond what we had been using before. And we got everything loaded up, and 
equipment a month in June. We replaced all of those equipment and all the new district equipment. Uh, it's a lot of hands-on street training. And on uh, the morning of uh, July 1st, we had everything on board and ready to go. So the transition was really uh, pretty smooth then because it had all been earlier. Correct. The trans transition has actually been taking place uh, for some 12 to 14 months. The original decision to not renew the contract was in uh, March. Uh, and April of 92. Mm -hmm. uh, in 93, we went through all this process, and then part of 94, and so that on July 1st of 94, we were ready to go. Mm -hmm. uh, we replaced all of our communications equipment, which is uh, compatible with City of Phoenix equipment, so we had to do a vehicle at a time, take it down, had it completely revamped, uh, upgraded. We have a computer a dispatch system uh, with a computer terminal in the trucks, uh, along with the radio equipment and the portables. All those things took time, and we mapped out the times, and then this, uh, worked with Phoenix people, they worked with suppliers, how long does it take to get it, when we get it, how long will it take to install, and we stubbed our toes a few times, but uh, we were ready to go that morning. Well, now the training is an ongoing situation. How, how many hours do they spend in training, and do they do it all themselves, or do they go to special schools? Uh, training is a minimum of two hours again per shift, uh, very similar to the physical agility training. The, uh, the minimum two hours of training could be classroom training, it could be on the vehicle training, it could be specialized training on particular items. Uh, the crew today is, is doing some specialized classroom training and command structure. Uh, we're going to have some officers' exams and promotional tests coming up here in the next uh, six to eight months, and so these guys are getting that type of training. Summer, most of the training is done either early in the morning. Uh, or it's inside type training. In the winter time, when the weather's a little cooler and it's nice out, guys like to get out and do their thing in the afternoons. Almost all of my guys are taking college level classes. Uh, you go through Phoenix College, Glendale College, fire science type classes. Several of the guys have their two year degrees in fire science. Or a couple of guys have bachelor's degrees who are taking additional classes in fire science. So there's a lot of training there. In addition, uh, we'll be going to the Phoenix Fire Training Academy for some very specialized training. Actually, uh, the fact that you do your training early in the morning should apply to doing interview shows, too, I think, uh, particularly during this time of year, right? Read? Right. Very definitely. OK. Now, this is some of the, uh, the gadgets over here, or, uh, handles and knobs and so forth that these people have to be uh, trained with. Uh, would they at any one time operate all of this? It's potentially, yes, they have the intake hose, the master stream intake, which is a four inch uh, large diameter hose on a hydrant, or multiple hydrants. Yeah. Uh, on a major fire, they theoretically could be operating uh, several hose lines on the ground being held by people. They have a master stream uh, nozzle on board the truck, which puts out a great deal of water. Uh, so they theoretically could be operating all at once. And the engineer is, uh, He's a key man in that whole process. It's his job to get the water from the hydrant through the truck into the hose lines where they can put the wet stuff on the red stuff. Now, that's a good, good statement. <laughs> okay. Now, what is the breakdown uh, per shift? Now, do you have an assistant chief? Uh, do you have the engineers and regular uh, standard fire people? Or how does that work? Right now, we have, uh, between the two stations, we have 10 men on duty at a time, plus myself, the chief. I work from 8 to 5 or 7 to 4, depending on time of year. Right now, it's a 7 to 4 type shift. I'm available for call uh, from my vehicle at any other time, uh, Monday through Friday. We also have a captain at each station. He has direct charge of all the other personnel, uh, and firefighters, and, uh, and paramedics, and EMTs. Mm -hmm. uh, his job is to provide that training, see if he gets there, do the physical agility test, schedule out other activities. We do our own inspections. Uh, we have some firefighters who are inspectors, they do specialized inspections, but the firefighters on duty guys do some of the general type of inspections. We test the fire hydrants, um, do various station duties, we keep the stations clean, we do minor maintenance work. We have a full-time mechanic who maintains the fire apparatus. So these guys are doing something all day long from 8 to 5 when their uh, work day is in. After 5 o'clock, we can start doing the exotic meals and TV <laughs> and basketball <laughs> games and things like yeah. that. Mm -hmm. And now that, uh, that shift, you say 24 hours? That's correct. Uh, they have a duty day from 8, shift starts at 8 a.m., they have a duty day from 8 to 5, and after 5, the time's their own. Oh, I Except see. Except they're in the station and ready to go at a moment's notice. Mm -hmm. uh, some guys uh, go to bed early, some guys study. Mm -hmm. uh, others, uh, the, the one the crew especially had a, 
had uh, miniature race cars going for a while. We even set up a oh, small wow. track on the on the gravel out here, and they were racing miniature race cars. Yeah. Because it got hot, and they kind of went to something else for a while. I would anticipate they'll go back to that. How, how do you work? Now, that is a fairly tight uh, group of people. What happens if you have a sickness uh, in, uh, say, an engineer or something like that? Everybody knows each other's person's job. Everybody can operate the vehicle. We have assigned people who operate it on a general basis on a regular time. But if, if something happens to that person, we have a group of 10 reserves or part-time people. And those people provide the backup. And anybody can move into the engineer's seat. We have acting captains. So if we have a captain to uh, get sick or if he goes on vacation, we have an acting officer who can jump into his seat and take over. And uh, I have a very good crew of people all the way around. They do an excellent job. Well, John, with all of the information that we've gotten today on the 911 uh, phone numbers, the ambulances, the equipment like this, I feel pretty good about being here in Sun City West and the uh, fire is a group that we have, and uh, it looks like we're under uh, pretty good surveillance here. No wonder that fee is going down a little bit. We hope it continues to go down, at least for in the near in the near future, and uh, be able to uh, to move ahead. And uh, I'm staying you out of here, so let's get you going. Okay, I'm going to be on my way now. Thanks a lot, uh, Chief. It does, and we'll be talking to the chief about all of the things that are going on because we're attending a classroom demonstration and also this is the fact that the, the uh, firemen anymore aren't the ones that sit around and play checkers that's for sure they do a lot of work and that's uh, i think they've remembered that way for years and years but anymore it's a busy time and they're schooling all the time and especially when they have state-of-the-art equipment like we have here in sun city west so we'll be getting together with the chief now and uh, he'll tell us all about this truck and its function I have a couple of questions here to ask about uh, this fire equipment that we have here. Uh, it's the state-of-the-art equipment, and I guess it runs a lot on uh, electronics and computers and so forth. Is that right? Is that plain, man? That's correct, Lynn. Um, environmentally, the engine is all computer-controlled, uh, just the same as most cars are nowadays, fuel-injected, computer-controlled, and all those types of things. The fire apparatus, we're also looking now at completely computerizing the pump operations. The truck that the, where we're using today has a completely computerized pump handle. There's no visible handles, there's no visible caps, there's no visible items that normally you would associate with a fire apparatus. What we have are push buttons and gauges. So the whole system is computerized. Well, that's kind of taken the fun out of being a fireman, and then I remember, uh, I thought maybe about the department sometime, that I get a chance to push all the knobs and valves that I ever thought I wanted to. That's kind of the way I am. I'm not used to this push button stuff. I like, I like yanking on the handle once in a while. Well, now this is part of a class, and it's part of the ongoing education of the fire people uh, working with their equipment and, and anything set. So when they do go out, they know exactly what to do, right? That's correct. Uh, in a, any fire situation, any emergency situation, first time is of the essence. The pump class today is learning how to draft. All the guys know how. They're re associating themselves with drafting. And primarily, they're going to learn about pump pressures and how to operate the specific pump, getting the exact items on it. When we relocate, you'll be able to see where the other end of this is. What we're looking at is the intake. We're drafting water out of an underground pit, about 2,500 gallons. We're sucking water up through a large hose. And in a moment, they'll be putting it out on the other end at anywhere from 15 to 1,600 gallons. Chief, I'm going to have to relocate, too. If you'll take a look down here, you'll see what I'm talking about. <laughs> How about that? <laughs> get back to the Chief here. Thanks a lot for giving us a demonstration on that. And I'm going to get back uh, with the Chief here. Now, I'd like to have him explain a little bit about how the water is being recirculated here and uh, what the pit is that they've developed, which I understand is, uh, is a design that the Chief made himself. So, Chief? Then what I... What we have is a, an underground pit that will store water. It also has a stairwell, and we have removable grates on top. So like today, we fill it up with water. We pump water for a pump test. When Ray needs to do mechanical work, he takes the grates off the top, drives the truck over the top, and he has a mechanical inspection pit. So he's able to get two uses out of the same pit. Many departments have an inspection pit and a pump test. This is where we've got both in the same site. Well, now 
have the gun that we experienced over here and watched it operate. Uh, that one is stationary. That doesn't go anywhere. That stays here, right? That is correct, Lynn. This is a permanently mounted, uh, what I call a cannon. Uh, we can put up to four inputs into it and pump uh, tremendous amounts of water in place. We can recirculate the water. We can do the pump test. We're not pumping water out onto the ground uh, in this particular type of a drill. And we get very accurate measurements as to what the truck is pumping. Well, now, I have a question about the crew that goes on this uh, on this truck here. How do they, uh, what's the number of people that will be on this truck when it goes for uh, a regular call? This particular truck will have a total of four manpower on a fire call. One of the men is from the ambulance, which is also going along on the call, except it's just the driver. Uh, that way we have the ambulance at the scene. We can respond to other emergencies as the one we're on and winds down. Uh, on an EMS call, this truck goes out with three people. All of them are firefighters, some are paramedics, and some are EMTs. They're all totally cross-trained, as we explained earlier. Of the total time that they spend here at the firehouse, uh, what would be an estimation of uh, the, the hours that they're in actual classroom or actual working on equipment here? Our standard day is a two-hour training session every working shift. The exception is on Sundays. Um, so they spend two hours training every day, whether it be practical drills such as they have today, total class time, or combinations of the two. Mm -hmm. Now, do they have uh, people that come out and work on these training sessions with them from uh, the manufacturer's point of view, or how does that work? That's correct. In fact, the gentleman helping uh, Ray today is the local dealer, uh, Canyon State Emergency Products in Peoria. They are the dealer for E1, the equipment manufacturer. Steve is here to provide the hands-on training straight from the manufacturer. So that's excellent training for the man as well. He knows all the ins and outs of that truck, and he's able to give the guys some better training. Well, Chief, I have a uh, I noticed inside the cab there that there uh, you had uh, their boots and equipment and uniforms and so forth were sitting in various areas. Uh, are those the men that are on duty and will go out on that truck when it's called? That is correct. Uh, the men who are assigned to the truck have all their turnout gear, their air packs, their boots, their coats, helmets, gloves, everything's on the truck right now. Mm -hmm. um, and they're, when they get a call, it's climb into the truck and dress out. Uh, normally they pull on their bunkers and slip on their coat, then they sit down, strap in with seat belts, that's a mandatory, and while they're in rapid fire they can be buttoning up the coat and the guys in the back will be pulling on their SCBAs and ready to go. Well, we found out what happened to the knobs, but whatever happened to the long pole that they used to slide down? I think it's a thing of the past, <laughs> at least in Arizona. I'm aware of one fire station in Arizona right now that has a sliding pole, and that's in the town of Tolleson. Now, let's review again the equipment that we have here at Sun City West. This is uh, the uh, Stardust uh, station here, is that what they call it? That's one? correct. Today we're at the Stardust station. We have here a uh, what we call an engine, but it has a ladder truck of quints. It has a 1250 GPM pump and a 55-foot truck-mounted ladder, as well as a complement of ground ladders. And we also have an ambulance at the Stardust Station. At the Camino del Sol Station, we have a 1500 GPM engine pumper. Uh, we have a two 1000 GPM pumpers, one here, and we have an ambulance down there. Mm -hmm. Well, again, what this means for uh, the city of... Uh of uh, Sun City West, I guess we'll have to put it Sun City West City, uh, is that we've got a great uh, fire protection area here. Anything that we've uh, missed here, Chief, that you'd like to uh, give us a little more information on before we go here? Lynn, we're here to help. We urge people that if you think you have an emergency, dial 911. There are operators on hand who can help you walk through that. We'd much rather come and find out that it's not serious as opposed to people waiting and and contemplating their next action, and the emergency gets worse. So call us when you think you have an emergency, we're there to help. I have one final question. Uh, I grew up seeing red fire trucks. I don't see a red fire truck around here. Can you tell me something for the reasoning behind the change in the color? Basically, to be seen. Uh, uh -huh. This is what they call optic green. It can be seen day and night. Unfortunately, most dark reds that are traditional in fire service disappear at night, even under bright headlights. They're hard to see. Optic green, it's not the prettiest color for a lot of people, but you can't miss it. You're bound to see it day or night. Well,
Well, I think that we're going to uh, ask Bob uh, if he'll go around to get some more footage on some of the fire people as they're working here. But that kind of takes care of our round and about uh, with the fire station here. And Chief Cole, uh, it's been great to have you here, you know. And I, I think that uh, what I'd like to have you do is come down sometime, Mr. Chief Rollinson, and visit us on our state. I'd love to. Okay. Lifestyles will design a furniture pack tailored to you and your budget, no matter how large or small that budget may be. Or will help you blend your old furniture with new pieces to complement your new lifestyle. And like the rest of the lifestyle we offer, that luxury service is absolutely free. And we have an enormous selection. So I'm sure that we'll be able to design a furniture package to suit your personal needs and do it at a price that will fit your budget. Our packages can be as complete as you want them, all the way down to the linen, the dishes, the bottle of wine, and even the corkscrew to open it. Thanks, Mom. So with everything to gain and nothing to lose, it makes good sense for everyone who is retired or going to retire within two years to fill out the Retirement Preview Plan application and drop it in the mail today or call 1-800-346-4556. It could be the most important decision of your life. And we hope to see you soon. Like always, I hope that this program has opened your eyes to a luxurious lifestyle. But this time, it is a lifestyle that you can afford. So, I urge you to take advantage of this sensational retirement preview plan and visit the villages, as I have done and learn firsthand that your dreams of a luxurious lifestyle can actually come true. Until then, bon voyage and bon appetit. I love it here. Great area to live. And playing the golf courses is wonderful. <laughs>